Thank you for joining this week's discussion of Go Erie Live, weekly discussions with newsmakers who affect and shape the Erie community. This week's topic is the Erie School District and its finances. Erie Times News reporter Ed Palatella will be hosting this discussion with Erie School District Superintendent Brian Polito and Financial Administrator Charles Zogby. Thank you to Gannon University for sponsoring this discussion and seeing the value in these weekly topics. Ed, take it away. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm here this morning with Brian Polino, the superintendent of the Erie School District, and Charles Zogby, the state-appointed financial administrator for the Erie School District. Good morning. So this morning, and thank you both for being here. Appreciate it once again. Superintendent's been here a number of times. Yes. I so say you're like those old, uh, like Steve Martin on the old Saturday Night, Saturday Night Lives. And he's <laughs> yeah. got an award for being there many times. <laughs> so thank you for being here. And Charles, this is your first time. So what we're going to talk about this morning is something that is um, one of the more critical documents um, in really the, this, the local finances is the Erie School District's financial improvement plan, which um, Mr. Zogby wrote and submitted to the uh, state on January 31st, and now it's under review by the Secretary of Education, Pedro Rivera. So we're going to talk about how this report came about, what's in it, and what happens next. So, Charles, if you wouldn't mind just starting off by walking us through the process of how the school district got to the point where we have a financial improvement plan. Sure, Ed, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, as your viewers, your readers know, the Erie uh, School District has been under some financial stress for a number of years. And um, over uh, s several of those years, the General Assembly has provided additional aid, uh, most recently $14 million to the school district. Uh, and it was with that $14 million that the General Assembly uh, also uh, created a provision in law to require a financial administrator uh, to oversee the school district uh, and basically my responsibility is to put together a five-year financial plan to assure the fiscal solvency of the school district uh, going forward so that 14 million dollars uh, in really extraordinary aid for the district so that's never uh, something that the General Assembly has to do again. There's a number of uh, school districts in the state that are in some stage of financial distress like uh, Erie Public Schools, but the assignment here again is a, a five-year financial plan as you referenced to basically put the district back on its feet uh, and ensure its fiscal solvency going forward. So Charles, this is a unique situation. I mean there's really, I mean there's other school districts that are in financial recovery or some, some type of oversight, but this situation is really unique, isn't it? Oh, it's, uh, it's very extraordinary. I, I was served as the state's budget secretary for four years, and I can say that a single school district getting 14, an additional $14 million put, in, put into its funding base is rather remarkable. And it's a testament both to uh, the real financial crisis that Erie was facing. It wasn't just uh, the district uh, crying wolf, as it were. It was a serious situation. Serious enough that the General Assembly felt compelled to put up $14 million. I know a lot of people in the community think that the district should have received more. Uh, the fact that it got that much is really incredible. Uh, and as I said, there's really only about a half a dozen school districts out of 500 in the entire state that are in this type of situation. So it is, to your point, rather unique. And your role is unique. I mean, you're, I mean, you're an appointed financial administrator, which is not the way it usually works with distressed school districts. Yeah, we're, uh, look at Pennsylvania is a, a, a state of uh, local control, right? And we hold that uh, very dear. Uh, just the, the imposition of uh, state authority here is very unique. There's only about a half a dozen school districts, as I said, that are in anywhere uh, near uh, sh uh, this shape in terms of uh, financial uh, concern about financial stability. So the General Assembly takes these things very seriously. The $14 million, as I said, was truly extraordinary, uh, but the message is also clear. Uh, we can't come back to the state, we can't go back to the state for more finances. The Erie's financial problems, Erie Public Schools' financial problems, uh, are to be solved here in the school district and not looking elsewhere. Superintendent, if you could kind of um, go into that a little bit. You've been pretty clear with the school board, not pretty clear, very clear with the school board that the district has this money and now it has to work through it, use the money to stay solvent. So 
And then what's been your, since the plan's been released, what's kind of been your role in terms of dealing with the plan and, and projections for the, for the coming year? Well, I, you know, I think, uh, you know, throughout the process, uh, Charles and I worked uh, very closely on the plan. Um, you know, I think that uh, the, the format that Charles used was a good one. He, um, you know, with his background as both, both a budget sec secretary and an education secretary, he understands, you know, the challenges we're facing and the fact that we have to uh, invest in our programming and our, our facilities here moving forward. So um, I'm very, very happy to have those type of items in the plan. Those came directly from our plans, or our strategic plan, as well as our facilities plan. And I really look at this, this plan as an umbrella over those two plans that really uh, determines what we can and can't do financially moving forward and really charts a path forward that, that, that I'm excited about. And I think it's, uh, it's going to show real results in, in the district and, and keep the, uh, the books balanced for the foreseeable future. So to some degree, reading through Charles's plan, I mean, he does endorse sort of the, the building proposal and the in the strategic plan in terms of education. I mean, he embraces that right. several points in several spots in the plan. Right. So you'll be moving ahead. Right, and we've already started that process. Uh, we uh, just recently uh, approved uh, our curriculum adoption for um, elementary English language arts. That's one of the things in the plan. Um, and we're in the process right now of going out to bid in the first part of phase one of our facilities program. Uh, again, that is part of the plan as well. And both of these initiatives would not be, you would not be able to take these about $50 million, which is That's correct. recurring annual aid. Right, right. Up until uh, receiving that $14 million, we were in crisis mode every single year. We didn't look beyond, uh, you know, the next year. The goal was always trying to keep the doors open and have enough money in the bank to, to pay payroll and, and pay our bills. So now, uh, this really gave us an opportunity to step back and, and spend a, we, we actually spent a whole year planning uh, because we know that we only have one shot at making this happen. And, um, you know, I think the plans that, that have come together through this are, again, a real positive and, and something that's going to drive the district forward. So part of going re live is that people will chime in and comment. So you'll see, you'll hear my voice every now and again from asking commenters questions. Um, and this kind of this commenter's question goes along with what you were just saying. What improvements will be made to elementary schools, and will what kind of money will be used for that? So the we we had the architects go through last year and uh, put together a comprehensive plan. They went through every one of our buildings, and the focus really, uh, because we know we have limited dollars, is to keep those buildings warm, safe, and dry. Uh, so they they actually came up with two hundred and eleven million dollars worth of. Uh, facilities needs, uh, but they did chunk that into uh, an $80 million phase one project, and that's what we're moving ahead with right now. Um, that, that will be funded through um, two items. One, we're, we're moving ahead with a $50 million bond issue uh, to, to fund part of that, and the other piece is uh, with the $14 million, we do have surpluses in the early years, uh, so we're going to use those surpluses to uh, fund the rest of that project. So we're we're looking, um, you know, starting this summer to start to do things. It's not going to be anything extravagant. You know, we're talking about uh, paving parking lots, uh, replacing roofs, taking care of some of the the structural issues on the outside of the the building envelope. Um, looking at different HVAC uh, issues, replacing boilers, things of that nature. We have another commenter who was asking about Lerda. Um, if there's any way that you guys could do, if there could be some sort of citywide LERDA, I don't know if you have a stance well, on that. Well, that's still under discussion. Yeah. It is, yes. The mayor has been pushing on, pushing that since he was elected, and that's still under discussion with the three taxing bodies, correct? Right, that, that that's correct. We And it's not off the table at this point. We're working with a number of individuals uh, to determine what we may be able to participate in LERDA. Okay, back to you. <laughs> So going back to the report, can you just highlight um, some areas that you believe are, you know, among the most, I, I mean, I know the entire report is important, but you have highlights. Can you just let us know what you view as the highlights in the report? Well, I think first is just a recognition of the real work that the district did in struggling through these uh, sort of uh, yearly financial crises that it faced. I mean, it clearly did a lot of work in, in making cuts. Uh, 
looking for savings in its budget, right? And so you sort of come to the landscape scar. There's been a lot of cutting. There's really not much when 65% of your spending is in your teachers and your personnel. There's just really not a lot uh, to do in the way of, of cuts. Um, with that, it's very clear that going forward, uh, once the district starts to give uh, some salary increases to its employees, and I don't think anybody expects that uh, teachers, administrators, everyone's going to go uh, at zeros for the next many years, you then start looking at, at the need for tax increases to pay for those because there just isn't a lot of options in terms of raising re additional revenues or, as I said before, making additional cuts. Um, and so um, I, I put a couple of potential savings options uh, uh, in my plan looking at outsourcing custodial services that could save uh, potentially a lot of money. Some other, uh, some other steps, and really that's to uh, hold down uh, what are likely to be the need for tax increases over the next many years to balance the budget going forward. And then I think most clearly is the uh, facility and the education plan that the superintendent has advanced. I think you can't look at the area public schools and say that there isn't a crying need for academic improvement. Uh, it's not to say that there aren't good things going on in the district. It's just that there's not enough kids that are making the kind of progress, and the superintendent is, and his team are very focused on that. So I think the things that they put forward in terms of new curriculum, training for teachers, investments in personnel along those lines, that's ultimately going to make a difference in outcomes uh, uh, for students. And that's really the most important. That's the reason the district's in the business, right, to, uh, to teach young people and so those investments are critical and then again as the superintendent said just uh, the building infrastructure at the end of the day you're sending uh, 10 11,000 students into these buildings you've got to make sure that there are places where uh, these uh, these young people can effectively learn and you can't do that uh, when you're uh, fearing every day that some major system whether it's the roofs it's the facade it's the heaters the boilers the coolers uh, that some of that is going to fail, and it's also going to be uh, much more expensive. Uh, so I think what we put together is a plan that uh, allows the district to make some critical needed investments in its young people and its education program and its facilities, in doing so um, uh, in relatively modest tax increases, cost of living. It's not that the district hasn't raised taxes in the past. It's often been episodic, and when it occurs, they're very large increases. So what we've looked at is the potential for some rather modest increases, cost of basically on, on uh, par with cost of living, that allow the district to make uh, critical investments that hope, hopefully improves the overall quality of the system. That's the goal. And you speak um, quite a bit in the report about the charter schools and how the district is, that's an area where the district has some control over um, how many students are in charter schools and how many are yes. not. And that's an area where if the district brought more students back from charter school or kept students from leaving for charter schools, that that can make a big financial difference. It's clear that uh, the issues surrounding charter schools is the single biggest, uh, as I call it, lever that the district has that can impact its budget. Uh, one of the biggest sources of concern in its budget has just been the bleed of students, about we measure about 60 students a year leaving charter schools, and that has a huge budget impact. Um, so we're not necessarily talking about, uh, again, taking kids out of charters and, and bringing them back. That would be great, I think, from the district's perspective. We're just talking about making improvements so that family students here have a reason to stay. And if we're able to do that, if the superintendent and his team are able to do that, uh, that's going to be a lot less financial hemorrhaging going forward, and it could have a tremendously positive impact on the district's budget. Probably the single biggest thing that the district can do to improve its financial health in the next number of years. You had quite a, you had quite a role in your job with the state in the charter school formation. I mean, what kind of perspective have you brought to this process in terms of the Erie School District? Well, I think it's, it's uh, one of the things, uh, and hopefully the superintendent takes this as a positive, uh, you know, sort of having been on the other side, if you will, um, it's, the, it's the fact that, you know, people in the community now have choices. 
and the district is a choice, but the charter schools are a choice, and people leave for, uh, make choices for a lot of different reasons, but for the district to understand that that competition is very real, mm -hmm. and that just as the other charter schools are out there trying to attract young people, trying to attract families to its schools, the district also has to give uh, families here a reason to stay, and it's got to communicate too. Uh, about those reasons. You know, sometimes people don't know what they don't know. There's a lot of great things going on in Erie Public Schools from uh, Collegiate Academy, which is probably the best performing high school in the Northwest uh, uh, corner of the state, probably one of the best high schools in the entire state, uh, to uh, career and technical education programs that are giving young people real skills to allow them to to graduate from school and to walk right into a, a great paying job. Those are things that a lot of the uh, people in the community maybe don't know about and being able to share those stories, tell those stories, um, and, and, and infusing in people a reason, hey, this is a, a reason why we ought to be staying in here in public schools, the opportunity that our kids can take advantage of. That's, that's something too that I think we've learned through this process uh, that uh, we're, in a competitive environment right now, and we're late to the game. Um, we've, you know, next to our funding issue, um, state funding issue, I think charter, uh, losing kids to charter is probably one of our biggest cost drivers right now. Um, and how we've been responding to that over the last 10 years is to, to, to try to balance the budget by cutting programs, closing schools, um, really consolidating. And, and what we've seen through that process is that that's not that's not the path forward because every time we close a school or reconfigure uh, our, our structure, more people leave because they're, they're sick and tired of the instability within the district. So um, as we've worked through this, it's became very clear that um, the only way to, to move us out of and stay out of that type of financial issue again is again to invest in our schools and our programming, start to show real results. And again, as Charles said, give people a reason to stay here in the district. And that's been a theme that you hammer away with, with the school board for months now, that you are in a competitive environment and you need to you need to improve, not just, you know, like Charles said, you need to educate these students, but also to keep the students. So it's kind of changed the, uh, certainly kind of, kind of changed the tenor of how the school district operates. Right, right. And that's one of the things that we looked at early on is, um, you know, we could continue on status quo. Um, it's still going to come with cost of living tax increases. Um, but, you know, when we get out into year three, four, and five of those projections, we're more than likely, again, looking at closing schools because there will be 60 kids every year leaving, leaving the district. But uh, we, we just don't feel that that's the way out of this. And, I, you know, again, just based on our experience over the last couple of years, it's just a downward spiral as we start to close schools and more people leave. So that's more an approach that we, we looked at as managed demise, as we're, we're doing the best we can to manage things as more kids leave and families leave for charter schools. And this year you've been fairly stable in terms of the charter school That's department. correct. Uh, the first half of the year we ran uh, about the same number of charter students as we did last year. Mm -hmm. um, just recently we've had a little bit of an uptick, so we, we have maybe 10 to 20 <coughs> kids right now more in our charter schools than we have in previous years. But again, that is a lot better than this average of 60 kids per year and the uh, over 100 kids that left the year before. So we're, you know, we're very uh, confident that you know, this is the approach. And I think just, again, not closing schools this year or doing any type of reconfigurations and sending the message that the district is stable and moving in a positive direction, I think has already shown an impact on those numbers. Ed, we have a question from a commenter. And I think this might be a good question for you, Mr. or for you, Superintendent. Does the school board have the political courage slash will to make the tough decisions recommended by the financial administrator? You might be the wrong person to ask. <laughs> <laughs> I you know I, I think when it comes down to it, they are gonna make the right decisions. We've been talking about this um, for, for the last year as we've developed the plan. Uh, there, there are some tough decisions ahead, but, uh, but again, I think that the, the key here, again, and, and they've already started moving down the path, is to, to take that leap of faith and invest in our, our educational programs and our facilities. We're already moving down that path. Um, you know, based on my initial conversations with the school board, um, you know, I feel that they're, they're ready to, to commit to some of those cost of living tax increases, and to me, that's the make or break. 
Um, that's the only way we're going to be able to stabilize this if we start to, to move in that direction. So on that, Charles, could you talk about what happens next? I mean, the, the Secretary of Education is re reviewing this. He's going to make a presentation to the school board on April 11th. That's um, correct. So um, where do we go from here? So the law, um, I submitted, as you uh, noted earlier, I submitted my plan to the Secretary of Education on January 31st. The law gives the Secretary 45 days to review the plan. He has to either approve it or uh, disapprove it, and if he dis disapproves it, to uh, basically articulate what changes are necessary uh, in order to get the plan approved. Uh, that deadline actually is coming up next week, so we should hear within the next week uh, sort of the, the outcome of the Secretary's decision. Uh, and then we go about uh, implementation, and um, uh, some of that is the education plan, the facilities plan. The district's already at work at that. It's a, a approved uh, English language arts curriculum. I think it's uh, getting closer to approving a, a math curriculum for the elementary schools. Uh, and then again, we go into the. We'll soon be going into the budget process. Um, and so the uh, the school district this year probably looking at tax increases as part of, as part of its budget. Uh, we'll know kind of the plan calls for about two and a half percent, but. Uh, we'll be resizing those in the coming months uh, as the numbers change. Um, and then we're looking at things down the road, like again, I mentioned the custodial outsourcing. See what potential savings might come from that. Um, and that'll be a, a decision that the board will likely have to make, assuming it stays in the plan, uh, that they would have to make probably next uh, budget year. And again, these are all tough decisions. It's not as if the board hasn't made them before. It's, mm -hmm move to close schools, for instance, which are also oftentimes the most difficult decision a school board can make. Uh, so this will all play out in the next uh, coming years, but again, this is about uh, keeping the district financially stable, solvent, uh, so that we don't have these uh, cr this kind of crisis reoccurring in the future. So now I'm going to ask you the $14 million question. So not a trick question, we've talked about this before. What happens, in your understanding, if the school board resists Approving these records, approving what's in this report. What happens then? Do you take over the school? The well, the uh, uh, the statute uh, probably isn't the clearest, but essentially says that uh, to the extent that the district doesn't uh, or the board doesn't follow the plan, that the district would be in non-compliance, and it's really up to uh, then the secretary to determine, I guess, whether you know how much non-compliance leads to. Uh, some greater action in terms of uh, ultimately putting the financial administrator in charge. That's a potential under the statute. I would just say, uh, at least until now, as, as, the, as the superintendent has said, this has been a very good working relationship. It's not as it, it, there maybe have been a couple of tension points, but that's to be expected. And I think, uh, look, at it, it's very clear that the board, the superintendent, the team here, is uh, you know very focused on uh, the welfare of the district and the students. They are, everybody wants to see the Erie Public Schools succeed. They want to see academic outcomes improve. We maybe have some differences on how best to get there, but that'll all play out, uh, and I'm sure it'll be a process ultimately that inures to the benefit of the young people here. And ultimately, according to the statute, the school board still retains the power to levy taxes. That's correct. So in terms of their decisions, they will be the sole um, arbiters in terms of how much taxes go up or when they won't go down. Unless it's a miracle, but, but you know, how much they have to raise them. A uh, brief kind of offside of that. The Times News reported that Tim, I think it's Kuzma, is that how you say his last name? Mm -hmm. Is a candidate for school board. He is also listed as a board member of the Erie Rise Charter School. Does this present a conflict of interest for you? Well, that would be something I've asked him before. He ran before, um, and he would have to. He would, he couldn't serve on two boards at the same time. Okay. So, but he did. He was unsuccessful in his most recent campaign two years ago. Thanks for clarifying. <laughs> so that's where we are with the. Uh, that's where we are with the plan in, in terms of where it goes next. And then, um, so you've been. Have you been in contact with the with the governor's office and the, or I should say, the education department? Well, I interface with the department. The department's been, been great. We've run into some hiccups, some challenges along the way, and I would say that the Pennsylvania Department of Education, at every turn when we've needed something, they've been incredibly responsive. 
look at they have uh, they have a, a big interest in seeing uh, all these districts succeed and uh, I think whenever we've faced a challenge here they've been uh, at the front of the line in terms of working with us to figure out how we uh, address it and solve it properly. And Charles, in terms of, I know you keep up a little bit with what's going on in Harrisburg and the superintendent, I know you're aware of it, but there has been some pushback in some quarters that, you know, Erie got this money or other school districts have received these bailouts, so to speak, over the years. I mean, you said that in Allegheny County in Pittsburgh, I mean, they're never seen, I mean, they got a lot of money years ago, the mm -hmm. Pittsburgh School District. So do you think there's any chance that the legislature will move in a path that that fixes the funding formula in the near term? Uh, the General Assembly uh, and the governor made some changes to the funding formula just a couple of right. years ago, right. moving towards uh, more of a weighted student funding. And the changes that they embraced also has the effect of driving more of the new money that's put into basic education to uh, poorer school districts. Uh, Erie, for instance, Erie Public Schools, will receive a larger share of basic education, new money in basic education going forward uh, than it would ha have under, under the old funding formula. Uh, having said that, I don't see any real major wholesale changes uh, on, the, on the rise. Uh, I just don't, there's the politics I don't think would allow for uh, what I would term a wholesale redistribution of basic education funding. And look at, uh, I would say that as uh, former budget secretary, there is no school district in the state from the wealthiest to the poorest that doesn't believe it's more deser it's deserving of more money. So uh, everybody, there's 500 hands out there that would love to have more. It's a limited pot. I, uh, I think uh, that 14 million was incredibly extraordinary. I would not bet on that reoccurring again. Yeah, yeah. I, I would agree with Charles on, on all that. When we did, uh, when we first, uh, looked at the fair funding formula, we ran through a, a scenario where all the money was redistributed. And based on that, we, we would have received a $36 million increase in our funding every year. But when you look at the districts that, that are helped and hurt by that, 180 school districts would see a benefit and 320 uh, would, would see a drop in their subsidy. So when you look at that, the that I don't think there's going to be political will to make that adjustment. However, I do want to point out, when you, when you look at that by, by district, there's that disparity, but when you look at it by students, uh, about half the students in the state are in schools that, that are overfunded according to that formula, and half are in uh, schools that are underfunded. So it just shows you that the big issue is with the urban school districts in the, in the state. And the way that formula works, it won't kick in fully for what, 20 years? 100 years yeah. it would take to redistribute right, right. everything. So, yeah. so, so, and we didn't have that time, so that's why we, we right. had to dive Check back and ask them for more. <laughs> right. Well, then it's before, <laughs> and it's in litigation too, before Commonwealth Court <clears> now, but that can take 20 years in itself in terms of how slowly that's going to I can't remember a year when there wasn't some sort of funding uh, litigation, and there always seems to be a court case going on. But in, but in terms of the governor's proposed budget, I mean, there were pretty much no surprises in terms of uh, education funding. I mean, how much How much was your... Gary Public Schools did very well, right, actually. Yeah, 1.4 million right, was right. the increase. So right. that, and that was actually more than we projected in the PFM projections. So that'll be taken into consideration as we work through our budget process. And, uh, you know, hopefully we'll help, again, and drive any tax increase down even further. Charles, anything else you might like people to know about this process? No, I think, uh, look, we've tried, we've, I've tried to position this where it's been very open and transparent. Um, and it's for the school board, for the community here to debate. I think, again, we're all united in terms of wanting to see uh, Erie Public Schools back on a, a better financial footing. Um, and outcomes, uh, most importantly, outcomes for the students improving going forward. And that's really the, the heart of uh, the focus here. And I can attend. Charles has been very open at the school board meetings, and next to the newspaper, he's been the subject of some ire. I think one school board member said they hate you, <laughs> which you can take that too. <laughs> That's progress, I guess, huh? <laughs> so anyway, Superintendent, anything that you would like to say about the pro anything more about the process or where the district is at? Well, I think at this point we're just eagerly awaiting the, the secretary's decision on the plan that should come down next week, and. 
um, we're ready to, to move forward with, with whatever direction is put in the plan. Well, thanks again for being here. I really thanks appreciate this. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Great to be here. Thanks so much for joining us to our audience today. And thank you to Mr. Zogby and Mr. Polito for coming in for this very important and lively discussion. Thanks again to our sponsor, Gannon University. Check back on the Go Erie Facebook page for upcoming topics and featured guests. We look forward to seeing you next week.